Hey yo, what's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ, the new HQ. We're finishing up the second installment of the top 12 running back ranking series. So we're doing 2019 fantasy football running back rankings. Last week we did rankings one through six. So if you missed that, I'll link it up here as well as down below. So make sure you check that out. Primero, segundo. I'm getting good at Spanish. I'm telling you, when you move to Brooklyn, you need to know your Spanish. You also need to be Italian. It's, it's fucking a crazy mix. You also got to be a hipster and only eat vegan shit and, and drink coffee that's only labeled coffee. It, it's a weird world I'm living in now. We're talking 2019 fantasy football, people, because that's the only thing we really talk about over here at the HQ. Again, since this is a new setup, I, I need your guys' suggestions whether it's background setup and decorations or it's the audio or there's too much background noise or lighting, man, I don't give a shit. Just tell me what you want me to do and I will do it because I'm a man of the people. So today we are doing our running back rankings 7 through 12 for 2019 fantasy football. Let's get cracking. Before we dive into the first one, make sure that if you enjoy the video, you hit that thumbs up button, or if you just enjoy any of the fucking videos I put out thus far, you hit that thumbs up button right now just to show me that you appreciate me because I appreciate y'all. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're breaking down everything 2019 fantasy football from here on out till the end of the season through the rest of my life pretty much. And if you are on iTunes, make sure you subscribe and hit a rating and review, five star preferably, but you know what? Hit me with the big facts if you dislike it or if you like it. A quick, 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 quick recap. Number one was Saquon Barkley. Number two was Ezekiel Elliott. Number three, Christian McCaffrey. Four, Alvin Kamara. Five, Melvin Gordon. Six, Dalvin Cook. Number seven is Joe Mixon of the Cincinnati Bengals. In the first installment, he was running back seven and he remains at running back seven. Not much has changed for me. He's still a workhorse in that Cincinnati offense. Uh, it's an offense that I don't love, however, so I do kind of uh, get a little weary or a little nervous about Joe Mixon. Like if he was my first round pick, yes, I would love him. But the reason you want to grab a first round pick in a fantasy football draft is because the advantage, there's no bigger advantage than having an elite fantasy football running back on your team. However, just having an RB1 doesn't necessarily get you there. Like David Johnson ended up being a fucking, and people are going to use that all summer. Oh, well, he finishes a top 10 running back. Listen, RB10 doesn't win you championships. That's the only concern I have with Mixon is, yes, you want a workhorse running back, but if he's like bottom tier of the RB1s and you have guys like a Melvin Gordon or a Kamara, uh, Saquon Barkley averaging 20 plus fantasy points a game, and then Mixon's there with like 14 or 15 creeping into that RB1 range, that's my concern. I don't know if he has the ceiling of those other other guys. He should be using a three down capacity. But again, this offense brings in a new head coach in Zach Taylor, a new offensive coordinator in Brian Callahan. Neither of them have any experience whatsoever in terms of even coordinating a team, let alone being a head coach elsewhere. But it's no guarantee that, I mean, I know extra media Marv is finally out of Cincinnati and this offense should run a lot more plays. They've been one of the most stagnant offenses over the last few years in terms of plays per game and time of possession per game, yards per yards per game or yards per drive, things like that, their offense has been just absolutely stalled out and uh, it was time for a change. But these young, unexperienced, inexperienced, excuse me, inexperienced coaches does not guarantee that they're going to be a high flying offense whatsoever. So I definitely still have concerns at the quarterback position in Cincy. I have concerns just uh, the overall offense. So I like Mixon, but I'm not sure he really has the ceiling uh, of these elite running backs. So I put him at RB7, kind of in this mix of a bunch of other red flagish running backs. Number eight is Le'Veon Bell of the New York Jets. He was my running back 14. The more I dove in, the more I kind of like Le'Veon Bell here. Now he's my running back eight. So he dropped six spots or he moved up six spots, I should say. So I've talked about it like seven times already in some of my prior videos, whether it's Fade the Public or was my, I don't know, I did a specific Le'Veon Bell breakdown video, which you could find up here as well as down there. He inks a four-year, $52.5 million contract, $35 million guaranteed. So the man got his money. He didn't get his crazy, crazy guaranteed money that he wanted to get. But still, man, I, I think you can live pretty comfortably. I think you can hit the jet skis down in Miami once you're done with football with $35 million. So Bell's got to be happy. Plus, he gets an extra year to rest up his body, which is very, very underrated in this situation, in my opinion. A lot of people are looking at it as, oh, he's been away from the game now. Now he's older. Like, who knows what's going to happen? That's the least concerning part for me. I like the fact that he took time away from the game after, you know, seeing such a heavy workload for years consecutively. Now, 
Excuse me. Like I said, at the end of the day, the most valuable pieces of a fantasy football roster are workhorse running backs. There's really no doubt here for me that Bell is going to be the workhorse running back. Now, I have hammered Adam Gase when I originally made my Le'Veon Bell video. I was on the side of shying away from Bell because I hate what Gase has done with running backs in his past, right? And in Miami, misused Kenyon Drake, misused Damian Williams, just misused that entire backfield. But I think even if he wants to use a running back by committee, his hand is absolutely just like forced into giving Bell all the work because one, he's Le'Veon Bell. Two, he just got that fat contract. So Bell being the workhorse does not scare me whatsoever. He is going to be the workhorse. My concern more is just is the offense overall. Gase has not led a successful offense since Peyton Manning single-handedly led Adam Gase in that offense back in like 2014 or whenever that last year was. And you look back at his three years in Miami, he had no idea how to use running backs. So I'm trying to get like a comparable, like who can we expect Bell to perform like in an Adam Gase offense? And I look back at 2015, the last time Gase was outside of Miami, he was in Chicago. He was the offensive coordinator there. Matt Forte was 29 years old at that time. So he was far from over with his career. It was his last year there in Chicago. Forte missed three games. So he appeared in 13 games, but he was on pace for 321 touches, 54 receptions. And that I think is probably a likely scenario for Le'Veon Bell. And I think that's definitely doable. I think uh, 320 touches is about what we'll see, if not closer to maybe like the 350 mark, considering he is going to be the workhorse. Uh, but he just does not have that ceiling that he had in Pittsburgh, where he was running behind the top five offensive line, where they gave him plenty of holes to work with, where they passed the ball to the running back. I think he averaged nearly six receptions a game during his time in Pittsburgh, which is just an astronomical number. That's like elite wide receiver numbers, I should say. That paces out to almost 95 to 100 receptions in a year. So um, Bell will not see anywhere near that workload in the passing game. He was consistently catching five to six passes a game. Um, and, and now, like I said, when you're looking at Forte, you know, he was on pace for 54 receptions. And I think over the last few years, we've been spoiled with these running backs that have come in and caught, you know, 90, 100, 85, like 75 doesn't really seem like that many ca uh, passes to catch anymore in fantasy football. But that still is a very hard number to hit if you're not in a good offense, uh, if you're not in an offense that tailors their offense towards throwing the ball to the running back. And that's just not something Adam Gase has done heavily. So the offensive line is definitely still a concern. I know people are like, oh, they added Arthur Marley and all these guys, but none of those guys that they added this offseason are really that good. So it's no major boost there. We'll see what they do in the NFL draft. Maybe they do add another piece from free agency. We'll have to see. They almost had Matt Paradis, but ended up fucking getting faded on that one. So maybe they boost up their O-line, which would definitely be an increase for me. He's still a low-end RB1 in my eyes, but the elite RB1 that we saw in Pittsburgh, uh, I don't think is coming to New York, at least not in 2019. If he has a very strong 2019 and this team just gets a little bit better, I think we could definitely see you know a top five, top three Le'Veon Bell maybe in 2020. So I think he's actually a semi-strong buy in Dynasty Leagues. Todd Gurley. Now, this is going to be the interesting case. If you guys missed the episode I had in which I brought Dr. Jesse Morse on, he is a doctor that works with the fantasy doctors. We broke down all running backs that were injured last year, and we talked about what their 2019 fantasy football outlook was going to be. Todd Gurley was someone we spent a lot of time on. Prior to this running back rankings video, I had Gurley as my RB2. He had started moving down once we got more news throughout the offseason. And, you know, they're looking to bring back Malcolm Brown. And they're looking to looking at a lot of different free agent running backs. And it just tells me that they are looking to pad the depth there. And they're probably a little bit concerned with Todd Gurley and that arthritis. Thing is, when Dr. Jesse Morse came on, we talked about Todd Gurley's arthritis in his knee. He's a fucking doctor. I'm a doctor too, but he's probably a little bit of a better doctor. He says that the tendonitis is a huge, huge deal. So I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to insert the clip of him talking about Todd Gurley into this video right now. Now he had this weird end of season where we didn't know what was going on with his knee. I mean, you knew there was something going on because you don't bench Todd Gurley for CJ Anderson in the playoffs if he's healthy. The reports come out that he has arthritis in his knee. Now, I don't really know anything about arthritis. I feel like I have it in like 19 different body parts, but that's another story. Todd Gurley, arthritis. What exactly does that mean going forward? Is that easy to take care of? And will he still be able to play at a very high level? So he, oh, okay, okay. So he is not a top five pick for you, is he? No. Nope. So um, if you all have a subscription to The Athletic, I did an, art an interview art slash article last week, two weeks ago. Uh, from the LA version, from the LA uh, Athletic, and it's basically talking about how challenging this is going to be for 
um, for Gurley to come back from. Oh boy. Here's the, here's the issue with arthritis. Why does he have arthritis in, in, in general? Because he tore his ACL in the past. Um, when you tear your ACL, you use, there's about a 40 to 60 percent chance you also tear your meniscus. Your meniscus is essentially the shocks for your knee. So think of um, driving, getting a car that's say brand new or five years old, um, and then you put three new shocks on it, but one of them is bad. One of them is still old. So when you drive down the road, the three tires that they hit a bump, it may have a little, a little bump, but not bad. That one that's old, you feel it, okay. and it's going to drag. That's the issue with arthritis and with meniscus, is that the meniscus, because what they do is they usually, uh, if you take off the top of the, the, the top bone of the knee and you look straight down, we have two semicircular rings. That's the meniscus. They're basically thick, fibrous cartilage uh, rings that uh, that basically prevent the bones from smashing into each other. Okay. Well, what happens is you can tear those, and, and and these don't heal in anybody. They just have, they don't have a good blood supply. So if the piece is big enough, they will uh, the surgeons will go in and trim out the edge uh, and, and leave as much as they can, but trim out the edge and smooth it down. Now what happens is uh, because that edge is missing now, those bones start to smash. That's what causes arthritis. So the arthritis is uh, is starting to develop in that area. And the issue is arthritis causes intermittent swelling, causes a throbbing, aching stiffness that gets better as you get going throughout the day, but never gets completely better. Okay. Never completely goes away. The issue is it's unpredictable. Normally, and, and patients who have this, I either give them a corticosteroid injection, um, or depending on how bad their knee is, I'll give them what we call a gel injection. Or if they're older and their arthritis is really bad, I start talking about a knee replacement. But not in someone who's in their late 20s. Right. So that's the issue is that you can't put steroids into this guy's knee every couple weeks or every couple months. That's not good for his cartilage. That's not good for his knee. So now you start talking about stem cell and PRP and these other types of injections. And yes, they really work. I do them in my office, but they're not going to make his knee pre-injury. It's just not. It's not going to happen. Jeez. So, so the issue is, yes, his knee may be good for seventy percent of the season, but when is that other thirty percent going to come? You know, it's like. The issue is there's no good surgery to fix this and then have him still play. There's no good procedure where you can go in and scrape out the arthritis. It doesn't exist. Boy. So the problem is it's like you're hoping that it cooperates, but what if he go, he bangs it up and then he has three, four weeks where it's just not settling down? Yep. So if like something were to happen in the preseason and, you know, you're hearing quiet rumbles like, oh, Todd Gurley is sitting out, you know, resting his legs or whatever, or if, you know, uh, he suffered some kind of minor knee injury and he'll be out for a week or two, that's a huge red flag. And you're immediately like, oh, it's starting now and it's going to linger, you know, like, so this is, this is a very big deal. Yes, this is the problem. I mean, and they owe him a lot of money. Yes. This is the issue with uh, ACL injuries, with with meniscal injuries in athletes who. So think of think of your knees as having uh, like tires. They have, they only have so much tread on them. So if he's been a running back since he was fifteen or whatever. He's what, 25? I don't know, just somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah, give or take. He's been running hard for almost 10 years. Yep. He's probably run harder now, in the past 10 years than most people will run their entire life. So that those tires are starting to wear thin. We don't get new tires. Those That's what we call a knee replacement. So the issue is he doesn't have the luxury of being able to just change out his tires and start over again. So he's going to make do. So assuming, I mean, Gurley's not going to drop to the second round in any fantasy football draft. If you have a back half of the first round pick, say your pick eight, pick ten or something like that, are you thinking about Gurley or is he off your board knowing that he's going to have to go in the first round? Correct. He's just like Fournette where I already know I won't be able to get a good value from him, so I'm just, I just fade him altogether. Okay. That is, that is fucking gold right now for my audience. You heard, you heard it here. Gurley is a fade in the first round. It's not a guarantee, but there's a very, very, very high likelihood that this affects his 2019 campaign. Todd Gurley, 
Get them off your big board. And he clearly has a big red flag bullseye on Todd Gurley, fading him in the first round of fantasy draft. So still Todd Gurley. He's still in one of the best offenses overall. So if you can get him at the back end of the first half or, or back end of the first round or the beginning of the second round because people will start catching on to you know what this is and uh, eventually pushing him down draft boards. Do not pick him in the top three. I would fade him at the top five. I would wait until he drops you, which probably won't be the case in most and if, uh, fantasy drafts, but you'll get a better player because of it. He has a huge, huge, huge injury risk. Please, please, please proceed with caution when it comes to TG300. Couple quick announcements to make. One, of course, if you're enjoying the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are not already subscribed. Same thing with iTunes. Two, I am giving you my top 25 running back rankings as well. This video is only going to go 7 through 12. Last video is 1 through 6. But if you want my top 25, the full top 25 on the computer, mobile, tablet, whatever, uh, I will link it down below. It will be the first link in the description. That will take you to my website where you just fill out your name or whatever. And that will take you to the top 25 running back rankings I have at this moment, live time, for PPR, standard, and half PPR, regardless of what type of leagues you play in. So that will be the first link down below if you want the top 25 running back rankings for 2019 fantasy football as of right now. In my draft guide, which is available for pre-order, the season long is on BigDogsDraftGuide.com. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. The season-long kit is still available for pre-order until like June, I believe. The Dynasty slash Rookie kit is already active. It's already live. So make sure you go check that out if you want my top 250 big board, all of my positional rankings broken down by tier, sleepers, busts, must-own players, um, just a million different articles that we're going to be adding to. Last year, it came out to like 150 pages long. So I'm telling you, it's the best thing you're going to be able to get out there in the fantasy football market. So check it out, bigdogsdraftguide.com. Running back number 10, Damian Williams of the Kansas City Chiefs. I had him at running back 15. He's currently at running back 10, but that's because the first time I made the, the running back rankings video were prior to free agency, prior to them signing Carlos Hyde. Damian Williams is, is truly, truly one of the uh, enigmas of the 2019 fantasy football season. When you look at the player, Damian Williams, who he is uh, you know, from a metric and a measurable and just a player standpoint, he is 27 years old. But you can't find yourself in a more enviable, enviable position than the starting running back in the Kansas City Chiefs offense. Really, really good workhorse size. 5'11", 222, ran a 4.45 40-yard dash, which puts him in the 95th percentile in terms of weight-adjusted speed score. He was around the 50th percentile for college target share. We saw him do really, really, really well catching the ball down the stretch for the Chiefs. Damian Williams, like I said, he's 27 years old. So you're like, okay, how did he just come out of nowhere? We didn't know about him for the last five years. Like I also said earlier in this video, Adam Gase misused the shit out of him, unsurprisingly, during his years in Miami. So this will be his sixth year in the league. So what we're working off of when it comes with Damian Williams, ranking him in the top 10 is literally the fact that he'll open the year as a starter in the Andy Reid slash Patrick Mahomes offense. They immediately extended him after week 16, two years through 2020, $8.1 million, which is the maximum of the contract with incentives. And that six game stretch that we saw down the end of the 2018 season operating as a lead back. Those are the two reasons that we have to be super optimistic about Damian Williams. A very small sample size in which he absolutely exploded and the fact that he is just opening up with Patrick Mahomes as his quarterback in this dynamic Chiefs offense. So let's take a look at the six game run down the stretch last year. It was from weeks 14 to 17 in the regular season and then the divisional playoff and conference championship. Now I know those two are in fantasy weeks but I think it still opens up the sample size and helps us really dictate what the Chiefs think of Williams and how they want to use him going forward. I'm going to rattle off some stats for you. Now, over that span, Williams was actually not too involved on the ground. He got double-digit carries in five of those six games, but more than 13 carries only one time throughout those entire six games in the divisional playoffs, and that was when they were rolling over Indianapolis. Otherwise, he had 13 or fewer carries in every one of those games. But his touchdown numbers and his receiving work was absolutely unreal. He caught 28 passes over those six games, which is 4.6 passes a game. He caught at least four balls in five of those six contests. There are not a lot of running backs that are going to give you a four-catch floor in fantasy. He had 10 fucking touchdowns over those six games. Ten. Six on the ground, four on the air. And it's hard to say that's fluky whatsoever because that's what running backs in this Kansas City Andy Reid offense do. We look at Kareem Hunt. He had nine touchdowns in his final six games before he got kicked out of the league. No pun intended. It's the RB in that offense. It really doesn't matter who it is. They're going to score a ton of touchdowns. 
We saw Damian Williams have 10 over the last six games. Kareem Hunt had nine over his last six games. Um, The Chiefs GM, Brett Veach, said the starting running back job is Damian Williams' to lose. You see the co-sign from the GM. They believe in the guy. They are not resigning Spencer Ware. The only thing they had behind Williams was the 472 40-yard dash of Darrell Williams. So they went out and inked Carlos Hyde to a one-year $2.8 million contract to compete for the backup role. This is great news for Williams because... It likely means now that they have Carlos Hyde, they're not going to invest, you know, heavy draft capital, anything before like the fourth or fifth round in a running back, if they even do, or sign another big name free agent to compete with him. The thing is like one year, $2.8 million is nothing as an NFL contract. Had they gone out and signed Tevin Coleman to that two year, 10 million that he got in San Francisco. Yeah. You'd be a lot more nervous and you would not feel good whatsoever about taking Damian Williams in the early rounds of draft, but Carlos Hyde, all but ensures that they're not going to bring in any competition for Damian Williams. Sure, Carlos Hyde is a great handcuff if you, if you want to handcuff him later, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Damian Williams is going to open the season as the starter, and he's going to get every shot to command that role and keep that role, and he certainly has the size to do so. Again, 5'11", 222, so it's not like he got lucky and he was just a scat back or a pass catching back that did well. He has a size to handle the workload, and he can catch passes. We saw that last year. The sample size is is absolutely what concerns me the most right we only have six games out of him which is why he's not top five and that's where Kareem Hunt would have been this year probably top three or so maybe you know competing for the 101 had he played out the rest of the year and was you know going into this year completely safe and not suspended or not on the Browns roster um so that is a concern they don't owe Williams anything um his contract wasn't huge and it's not like the regime drafted him here right he was drafted by Miami and then came over to the Chiefs so they have no allegiance to him they didn't use draft capital on him if he struggles or if he gets hurt and the backup performs well it is absolutely not 100% his job to just come back in and start again so that is the concern for me but obviously the upside of being the running back in the Chiefs offense is way too hard to ignore being the running back in the Indianapolis Colts offense behind Andrew Luck is also fantastic and that's why Marlon Mack ends up as running back 11 on my 2019 fantasy football running back rankings list remember if you want my top 25 link is down below hit that thumbs up subscribe to the channel if you are new Marlon Mack was my running back 16 the more I dive into this though the more I absolutely love Marlon Mack and honestly he might creep up into like my top eight nine rankings for running backs you are not going to have to draft him anywhere near you're going to have to draft a guy like Joe Mixon who will probably end up going in like the first ish round uh by the time drafts come around you won't have to do that with Mack which is fantastic Every time Marlon Mack falls to you in the third round, you smash that cop button. Cop, 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 cop. Marlon mother fudging Mack. He came into last year banged up. Only ended up playing in 12 games. He was close to 1,000 yards on the ground. 12 games, almost 1,000 yards. He finished the year with 908 yards on 195 carries, 9 rushing touchdowns in 12 games. He caught 17 passes for 103 yards and another score. So you're looking at 215 touches, 10 touchdowns, and over 1,000 yards from scrimmage in 12 games. All Marlon Mack has ever done his entire life as a running back is be really, 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 really good. Yes, he went to USF, Southern Florida. He had offers from a lot of D1 schools. He faded them. His first game in college at USF, he went for 275 rushing yards. He was dynamite as a freshman. He went for 1,400 yards from scrimmage as a sophomore. 1500 yards from scrimmage as a junior he had the bad rookie year with the Colts but what do you expect they didn't have Andrew Luck and of course it was going to be an absolute shit show no one on that team did well so I would scratch off the one year Marlon Mack played bad and look at this fucking five other years that we have of Marlon Mack being an absolute stud last year the first year he actually had Andrew Luck back in the offense 215 touches 1000 yards from scrimmage 10 touchdowns in 12 games now you look at the situation he's in Indy is set up to make a Super Super Bowl run not just this year, but probably the next two, three, possibly four years in a row. This offense is going to be absolutely fantastic, and Mac is going to get all the goal line work here. So that's that's the big key. Is like, you know, I will get into what I'm a little bit concerned about in terms of the receiving game. But when you're in an offense like this, and you have a guy like Marlon Mack who's going to get all of the goal line work, they're going to be so good. He's going to get so many looks within the three, five yard line. How can you reasonably project Marlon Mack? After he scored 10 touchdowns last year in 12 games, and this offense is only going to get better, this offensive line is going to get better, how can you reasonably project him to go under 11 and a half, 12 touchdowns this year? And if that's the case, if you have a running back scoring 12, 13 touchdowns, he's almost guaranteed to finish within the top 
seven, even five running backs for fantasy. Like I said, the offense is only going to get better. This line is elite. They're young, and the aspect of continu- continuity in the offensive line is one of the biggest underrated pieces when looking at offensive lines. You could say, like, oh, he's good. Yeah, he's good. The PFF grades were great. But playing together, you know, year over year is what gets these, te- these teams and these lines better. And these guys are young, so continuity is even exponentially more important. And that's what we have here, man. The pass catching, like I said, is what makes me nervous because Naeem Hines was so involved. He had 81 targets last year. But, 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 of course, we got to dive into the big facts. You look at Naeem Hines in the 12 games with Marlon Mack versus the four games without Marlon Mack. Hines was only averaging 3.9 targets a game when Marlon Mack played. If Mack was healthy, we're looking at Naeem Hines with that pace. 12 game sample size, that's good enough to say that's what he was going to see. We're looking at Hines as like a 55 target back probably. And you're not looking at him as this elite pass catching weapon, right? And Mack also isn't a scrub in the passing game whatsoever. His college target share was in the 80th percentile. You combine those two things together, knowing that Hines is really not that involved when Mack is on the field. And Mack has a history of being a very good pass catching back. And I don't think we're as concerned as a lot of people are making it out to be. Listen to a couple of these stats that I found, man. The Colts last year were 0-4 in games without Mac and 9-0 and in games where Mac played at least 40% of their offensive snaps. Did you just hear what I said? 9-0 and in games where Mac played at least 40% of their offensive snaps. If anyone has ties to Indianapolis, if anyone has ties to the Colts front office, let them know that, please. Have them put Marlon Mack on the goddamn field for 80% of their plays, and they're going to go 16-0. It's a fact. Their team was so good when Mack was on the field and getting a lot of touches. He had individual game lines. L- listen to these individual game lines. 21 touches for 159 yards, three touchdowns. 17 touches for 69 yards and a touchdown. 27 touches, 149 yards and a touchdown. 28 touches, 149 yards, two touchdowns. 28 touches, 118 yards and a touchdown. 26 touches, 154 yards and a touchdown. We are so severely underrating Max upside in this Indianapolis Colts offense for 2019. I literally, I, I really think I'm going to move him into my top eight running back rankings sooner rather than later. He is is just set up in in one of the best situations you could possibly be in with an elite offensive line, an elite quarterback in an offense that's going to be very good. Their defense took a huge step up. They're going to keep adding pieces through the draft and free agency, and the overall team is going to be so good. So they're not going to ask Andrew Luck to pass as much. And if Mac takes any sort of step up in the passing game, if he catches 40 passes next year, he could easily compete for a top three or top five fantasy running back. So I love Marlon Mack. One guy I don't love, David Johnson. The last running back up on this list, he is my running back 12. He was my running back 10, but I moved him back a couple spots. DJ was straight up bad last year. I'm sorry. There is a lot to be said for this Arizona Cardinals offense, and there's a lot of excuses to be made. Offensive line, offensive scheme, coordinator, head coach, all of these things. And all of them are correct. But the one thing people are just completely fading is the fact that David Johnson was bad. If you watched him like I did, I watched a lot of him because I owned a lot of him in redraft leagues. He didn't look explosive at all last year. He did not look elusive whatsoever, which is really at the core of David Johnson, his analysis, what makes me nervous. And yes, the team was bad, and they're going to probably improve with Cliff Kingsbury as the head coach. And you know, I I know that comment will get some people mad, and they'll be like, no, David Johnson was good, blah, blah, blah. So I wanted to back it up with the big goddamn facts, because that's what I always do. I went into pro football focus, I went into player profiler, and I wanted to make sure that David Johnson was actually a bad running back last year year and lo and behold he was fucking bad he had the 40th graded run grade per pff out of 47 running backs 40th of 47 his elusive rating was 43rd out of 47 his missed tackles forced per attempt 0.09. Literally only Jamal Williams was worse in that category last year. His juke rate on player profile was 51st, which is the number of your percentage or your rate of missed tackles forced on a juke or a a miss, whatever, a missed tackle. Um, So I wanted to get both pro football focus and player profiler because those can be subjective to whoever's watching the film and making the stats. So no, he was also awful on player profile. His yards created per carry was 52nd in the NFL. So now we're basically, you know, he wasn't good last year. So you don't at me because I just fucking hit you with the big facts that he was actually fucking terrible last year as a running back. And he missed the entire 2017 season. So we're going to be going on three years since we've seen David Johnson actually be good on a football field. And he is at that you know, getting towards the older age of being a running back. I know he's not that old, so I'm not going to throw the age in there as a huge piece of analysis. You don't see a lot of running backs, you know, hit their prime, 
then come down from their prime, and then get all the way back up again. There was Adrian Peterson. Yes, it could happen with David Johnson. This new offense, this new scheme could absolutely revitalize him. But for the people that are getting super high on him, I would just say I would take a little bit of caution. I don't expect him. It's sort of like Le'Veon Bell, where he, yes, he should be in that workhorse role. But like, how good do you expect the offense to be? They didn't, you know, they're not upgrading their offensive line yet. They're going to have to do it through the draft. So it's still going to be an offense that's not scoring, you know, 27 points a game or anything. And it's just really hard to say why David Johnson played like that. You know, he was so good in 2016. He missed all 2017, of course. And then he was just so bad last year. And I can't, you know, and those numbers were all outside of the offensive line play. So like yards created, missed tackles, forced, those have nothing to do with the offensive line play. So I don't know, man. It's it's a situation that scares me, which is why I put him at running back 12. If he falls, he's not someone I'm completely fading. But if I'm going to have to reach for him, if he's going to be my first round pick at like number 12, or if I'm going to have to use like a top 15 pick, David Johnson will probably not end up on most of my teams. But we'll have to see what happens in the offseason. Maybe they use, you know, two or three of their first three or four picks on offensive line, which I would love, although continuity is what's going to make them stronger and they probably won't be that good until the following year. But David Johnson is an interesting case. So I want to hear your guys' thoughts on, on these players because I know this like 7 through 12 was kind of crazy and probably a little more fade the publicish than you probably anticipated you know, with Dalvin Cook at six, I know that wasn't seven through 12, him at six, Marlon Mack in the top 12, DJ all the way at 12, Todd Gurley down at nine or 10 or whatever. So I want to hear your guys' thoughts on, uh, do you agree with some of the things I've said? Do you disagree? What are your hottest takes this year at the running back position? Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. Get the top 25 running back rankings, standard, half PPR, full PPR. First link in the description down below. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Make sure you check that out. It's got everything you need to prepare you for the 2019 fantasy football season. I'm out of here. I love y'all. Peace.